Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me okay? No? Is that better now? That is better. Welcome to the Scottish Parliament, to the Festival of Politics, and to this event which has been put together with the help of the iWrite Book Festival in Glasgow. My name is Stuart Kelly. I'm an author and critic with The Scotsman, The Guardian, and The Times. And it's a pleasure to be here to sort of coordinate this talk and debate on the relationship between Scottish nationhood, politics, and literature with three of our very finest authors. On my extreme left, it's quite frightening having to say that everyone's on my left today. <laughs> on the extreme left, James Robertson, the author of four novels, several collections of short stories and poetry, and the person who was uh, the first, and I think to date, the only writer in residence to the Scottish Parliament. Uh, I don't know what he did, but they don't seem to have asked another writer back again till today. And he only lasted three days as well. <laughs> um, in the middle, uh, Ian Banks and Ian M. Banks, one of our most prolific writers of both social realist and science fiction. Uh, I've lost count of the number of books that Ian has done. I think we're on 24? 20 something. Yeah. 20 something. I've lost count as well, frankly. Um, he's also a non fiction writer who did a tour round Scotland based on the whiskey industry. And finally, Louise Welsh, one of the leading writers in the younger generation. She's done five novels, uh, two of which were set in Scotland, two of which were set in Germany, and one of which was set in Elizabethan England. So please, just to begin with, join me in welcoming our panel. Um, you may have seen that Ian McEwan, the novelist, who's at the slightly larger book festival uh, to the west of the city, uh, gave a talk the other night where he said that the union of parliaments was not a union of literary cultures. And he took a great deal of objection to being described in the programme as a British writer. In conversation with the First Minister, Alex Salmond, he insisted that he was an English writer and that English writing and Scottish writing had very different traditions. Each of the panellists is going to speak for just a few minutes so we can outline broadly where our positions are. Then I'll engage them in conversation uh, until about the halfway mark, and then we'll open it up to you for you to ask questions to the panel. There's a roving mic, so when there are questions there, could you wait till the roving mic comes up to you? So, James, to begin with, um, the connection between Scotland's literature and its politics. <clears throat> well, um, I think any literature reflects the, the, the society, the culture, the community that it comes out of. Um, and I think that's just as true of Scottish literature as it is of any other country's literature. Um, I mean, and we could get into a debate about the boundaries of literature and the, 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 na the, the, the national or cultural boundaries of literature. Um, but fundamentally, when you read fiction or poetry or drama, um, you, you are reading um, or, or hearing or, 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 or seeing um, a, a, writing that's come out of, of, of the place um, that it's describing. And um, I think one of the things about Scotland is that, it's, that, it, that is, there is quite a lot of politics in Scottish literature of the past, but, it, but, it, but it, in a weird kind of way, it's been, it's been separate and, and disenfranchised in the same way that Scottish people would, were disenfranchised from a Scottish politics for so long because of the absence of, of this place. Um, so if you go back in time to, to, to Walter Scott or John Galt or even more recently to, to, to um, writers of the, of the early 20th century, the, like Lewis Classic Gibbon, for example, the, the, the politics are absolutely clearly there in their writing, but they're not connected or associated with the political process in quite the same way as, say, the novels of, I don't know, Anthony Trollope or um, um, Disraeli <laughs> in, in England. Um, but I think that's, you know, so I think that's a reflection uh, of, 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 of the kind of society we've been and where we're going. Um, and the other thing I would just say is it seems to me that Scottish literature has changed hugely in recent years by becoming much more multi-voiced and much more um, diverse in, in, in what it's saying and who is saying it. But that is, again, a reflection on the kind of society we're becoming, and that seems to me a thoroughly good thing doesn't necessarily make the literature any less Scottish, but it does make it more interesting and diverse. Thank you very much indeed. Ian. 
Um, well, I think in the failure traditions of uh, one of the ideas behind this place was not to have you know, a sort of competitive sort of battle uh, like, like what they have in Westminster. So that's why it's designed like this rather than you know, sort of competing benches. Uh, I, I can find nothing to disagree with there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I think the, uh, to go back to what uh, um, McCune was talking about, uh, the whole British thing. I mean, I do feel, to some degree, British, in the same way that I feel, you know, North European and European, you know, and you become slightly daft about it, and I feel, you know, human. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and potentially, you know, allied with, some, with the artificial intelligences that you may one day create. Uh, so, I mean, there's all sorts of different gradations. Certainly, I am Scottish. Um, but, I mean, the way that I sort of think of myself as, as a writer uh, was as, just as a, as a person. It's now changed over the years. Um, I absolutely horrified my mum and dad around about the age of about eight, maybe nine, when I said that I felt more British than Scottish. And they kind of looked at me like I was a changeling, you know. <laughs> um, uh, 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 that really, I think I was largely down to the influence of, you know, the BBC and so on, just um, in particular at the time. I think we only had the BBC. We didn't even get STV or whatever, you know, at the time. Um, that, you know, I think really did change. I think it changed with Thatcher. It changed with the end of... One Nation Toryism, and it changed even more in a sense when the Labour Party stopped being the Labour Party, became New Labour. You could kind of tell it was different, yes, from the, the new the word, and you know was kind of caught up in this you know, the, the the cult of greedism basically and marketology, this the idea that uh, the market is the only way to um, you know solve any given problem whatsoever. Uh, although it's interesting that uh, just a couple of days ago uh, that, that um, one of Murdoch's um, offspring. Uh, basically turned on one of his other ones and said, no, you were wrong to say that only profit you know, guarantees whatever the hell it was, you know, goodness and wonderfulness. Um, so I think it was that. It was, it was, these, it was the, the political change that uh, made me feel much more Scottish. And so I, you know, having been, you know, one of the sort of the vague left, uh, leftish sort of people who equated, um, you know, nationalism, you know, almost with national socialism or whatever, it was just a bad thing, you know, you wanted to be part of the, the entire world working class. That was, you know, the way, the way to go. Um, I think that that entire aspect of, of international solidarity has kind of taken a back seat, and now you're just looking for whatever potential political gains you can you can find, and a way of, sort of saving um, you know, a more sort of left wing, a more um, communitarian uh, bit of you know, ground that you can stake out within any given territory. In our case, it's Scotland. I think it's it is a given. It's that thing about the settled will that Donald Dewar talked about, the settled will of the Scottish people to have a, a parliament again. I think there's a kind of settled will that's generational, it's across the, the various generations, that we are you know, sufficiently different from the way that the, the English in particular vote, especially the English of the South East, of course, the way they vote, that um, it makes absolute sense from a purely pragmatic point of view for us to have our own, our own parliament. And, and I would argue, yes, our own, our own nation. So... Uh, and that, I think that, apart from that, the only thing to say about the literature aspect is that, um, at its best, literature can do in a sort of strategic way what journalism is there to do in a, um, a tactical way. The day-to-day -day work of journalists is to, and, and week by week as well, but even you know, literally, the, the next day, the print is there, or it's on your, your iPad or whatever, and it's keeping the politicians honest, right? And you're doing it you know, literally within hours, in a sense, when you're reporting something that happens here or, or whatever. And writers do it on a much more greater you know, sort of, uh, time scale over, over, over years. And that is our function, such as it is. You know. Louise, are you going to agree with? Um, I'm going to vehemently disagree. That's more like it. And also agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of literature, in terms of being a writer, I never go to my desk in the morning thinking, here I am, a female Scottish writer going to my desk to write a book by a female Scottish writer. It is just something that we are, isn't it? And I think we only really become self-conscious about it when we have discussions like this. In fact, um, it's important for me not to think too much about myself and my identity, I feel, when I go to my desk to, to, to make my work, whatever it, it may be. I feel very strongly that writers... Um, whatever their, their class, their ethnicity, their sexuality, should be able to write anything, anything at all. I also feel it's very, very hard not to write a political novel or to write a political piece, um, because I think politics is us. It's, it's part of us, and we are, of course, um, the product of the society that we are a part of, whether we were born here as, as we all were, or whether we've come here from, from somewhere else. 
Um, so, so yes, I think nationhood is important. I don't think as a, a somebody who makes things that I consciously think about it as I work. Perhaps I do at points, I don't know. Um, I guess the, the, the thing that I would disagree with, I, I think there are other, there are of course many other things, which, as I'm sure you'll both agree, that are, that are important in terms of identity, in terms of politics, and that is of course things like gender, like ethnicity, like sexuality. Um, and I would disagree with James slightly on this. I think, I, I think actually we're, we're not representing the range of voices and experience that are within our country, that are within Scotland um, in literature. I feel very much um, that it's, you know, on, in five, uh, the fingers of your hand, can, can you name many writers of colour in Scotland that have any degree of prominence? I can, make, I can name quite a few um, lesbian writers. I find it actually quite difficult to think of more than a couple of out male gay writers. Um, so I think, I think we're not actually at the moment representing in the way that perhaps um, other countries do. I don't think we're as successful as um, people south of the border in, in expressing that range of viewpoints. I don't have a policy to put in place to solve this. I think it is interesting. I think it's, um, I think it's a failure in our country that we somehow at the moment are not creating the conditions whereby people that are having these experiences are somehow um, feeling able to, to, to create work. And I wonder, it's more of a question really, it's more of a question, why, why is that not happening? Um, in terms of being a female writer, I am so happy to be in such distinguished company. But James, you remember the last time we read together, I said, every time I'm on stage, I am outnumbered three to one by men. <laughs> um, and this perhaps is representative again of Scottish society because friends that work in different disciplines who are female tell me that this is exactly what happens. So there are a lot of women writing, there are a lot of women getting published, they're not getting this, the, 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 the other means to express themselves, they're not being reviewed in the same way. This is sadly reflective, I think, of Scottish society and politics. In, in one crit critical piece that I did, I did suggest at one point that the next great major Scottish novel may well be written in Polish. But, you know, there's an extent to which that reflection of society yeah. is problematic. I mean, James, to turn to you first, and the land lay still, your kind of domestic, epic, tragic comedy of the last 50 years, uh, and even more than that, that seemed to me very much an attempt to kind of create a new national story. If, if, if the nation is, as Benedict Arnold says, the imagined community, then the writer is the, the chief imagineer. And part of what that novel, to me, seemed to be doing was saying there is another story to tell. Um, was there an anxiety when you were doing that, that, you know, that it, how to make it just one of many stories, that it wasn't about manifest destiny or or uh, the covenanted people. Oh God, what a ghastly concept. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, and I think just to, just to follow on from what Louise said, I mean, I suppose what I was saying earlier on was that, that we, are, we are significantly more diverse now than in terms of what we produce in life writing than would have been the case a generation ago, I think. Um, certainly in terms of, certainly in the representation of, of do, do women writing. Do you not think? Do you think so? I don't know. Yeah. I think... Um, when I think of people like uh, Janice Galloway and Liz Lockhead, Naomi Mitchison, I don't know, but perhaps, we, perhaps there are more female writers, but, but mm -hmm. I'm not sure. If, if not in terms of a generation ago or even two generations ago, mm. certainly the difference between the um, state of writing in 1814, 1820, and as it is now, where, you know, I think I could maybe name I don't two think we, I don't think female we know, writers then. I think that we have lost a lot of voices. I think, actually, it, is it just suddenly that women discovered that they could pick up a pen and write? Did that just happen in the last 30 years? Or were there many, many women writing who, um, who just didn't get, didn't get the opportunity? I was looking at the Canongate um, collection of female poets um, today, and it's a big book, mm. you know, but there are lots of voices in there that we haven't heard, just as um, when we think of the abolitionist female campaigners who were composed hugely of, you know, largely of women, we don't know who they were. 
they weren't recorded. They weren't. So I, I think um, actually there may have been a lively scene. We just don't know because their voices are lost to history. I mean, sort of comparison would probably be. I mean, I think that's that's a given anyway. Yeah, but is you know how would the Scottish you know, experience in that compared to to the English one? You know, were there were there more you know uh, published English female writers than, than Scottish at any given point? Has it always been the case, or is that? Do, do we always have to compare ourselves to the English? Well, they speak the same language, you know, <laughs> and they're nearby, you know, so it's, it's a lazy man's option, as opposed to all women. Well, I think it is I, kind of yeah. because I said, and that says because we have been in terms, you know, shackled, forced to be part of the, you know, the I, same I, culture. I'm not, I think I'm it, not saying that Scotland is the worst place in the world, but oh, but, no, but you know no, what, no. what I would like to discuss is the Scottish seen really um and I, I think it might just be a little bit too neat to say mm. it's the english's fault oh well well i wasn't i wasn't saying that I'm just saying they, they seem the most obvious other you know sort of uh, relatively similar lot to compare ourselves to i just wonder the thing about but one, the, one of the things i find interesting about that is is it, and it seems to me that we have we in scotland there is a there is a quite a long a very long tradition now which is now increasingly being recognized that we are not a monolingual literature. There's Gaelic, there's Scots, there's English. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting that Stuart says maybe the next great Scottish novel will be written in Polish. I mean, I think, in some respects, I think, and I, I'm really, you know, probably talking to my heart, but um, perhaps where we have got to makes that kind of movement more likely and more possible, uh, certainly, I think, than would have been the case you know, a couple of generations ago. I'm stretching back a bit now. <laughs> Um, but um, you know, I, I, you don't. I don't get any sense um, that English literature conceives itself as being a kind of multilingual literature. And I kind of like the idea that actually we might we are we are. You know, very often we talk. The, people talk about the three languages of Scotland, but I kind of like the idea that actually we might start talking about the five or the seven or the nine languages of Scotland, which maybe comes back to one of the points you were making. You know, that maybe there are voices out there that we're not hearing. Um, uh, uh, you know, from different communities. But yeah. is there a point there about um, one thing which has tended to define certain other debates about nation states was a linguistic homogeneity? That if you take, for example, the Basque Country or Quebec, there is a unified language which they can use as a signal of cultural difference. That much as I think that the idea of a sort of polyphonic Scotland is lovely, we may actually get to a point of mutual incomprehension within it that it actually fragments into different traditions rather than binds it together into one? Um, well, I, th I don't, no, I don't really fear, I don't fear it, and I don't necessarily think it will happen. Actually, I like the idea that, we, that you can, what's that Walt Whitman phrase, you know, I'm, I'm I contain large, multitudes. I, multitudes. I, I, don't, I don't think that's a, and to be honest, I think, in a sense, that's one of the reasons why we have, we have progressed in a reason, certainly in a, in a pretty civilised way and in a bloodless way so far to the position we're at now and may progress further in the next couple of years because I think there have been a lot of political attempts to, to be as inclu inclusive as possible in terms of taking people on to the next, you know, the next phase of what, wherever this journey is that we're on and wherever it ends up. Um, and I kind of like to think that the literature, if it doesn't fully reflect that now, may reflect that you know, in, in, in coming years as well. Just to, to raise a different point slightly, um, part of the shaping of the way this has been phrased in the programme is how much it reflects politics. But also it can reflect non-existent politics or it can create a sort of speculative politics. And both with Louise and Ian, you've written in genres which allow for a kind <coughs> of speculation about politics rather than saying you know I'd better make sure I get the Prime Minister right if I set this book in 1972 latter half of. So can we talk a bit about the kind of way in which literature gives us potential feasible politics rather than has to be chained to the actual politics? Mm -hmm. Ian, I think you... Uh, well the stuff I'm writing is it's kind of so dissociated from you know, where we are at the moment I'm not entirely sure that it, it's well I suppose it's as relevant as people think it is, but I mean, you'd, be, you'd struggle to, um, you know, work out a programme of how to get, you know, sensibly from here to there, uh, just to pull people in who, who don't know anything about the, the science fiction stuff that I write. It's about this um, civilization called the culture. It is, I wish I'd come up with this phrase, <coughs> a post-scarcity 
civilization. Um, one of the cultural sayings is that money is a sign of poverty. Basically, a checkbook is a ration book. If you've got enough of everything to go around, you don't need money to sort of parcel out what, what you do and don't have. Um, and from that point of view, I mean, it's, the, it's, the, it's me getting all didactic. You know, although there's lots of you know, um, three-legged aliens toting laser cannons, obviously, uh, and very large <laughs> spaceships, and even longer names, uh, there is a sort of serious political point, but it, it's kind of quite so sort of heavily disguised. Um, but how relevant it is, I don't really know. I think it, it, it's maybe, my, my only excuse for it is, was, um, is that it, it's maybe an example of the way you know, life might be smashing and terrific in the future. You know. things, I, I grew up reading all these stories about uh, mostly dystopias. Yeah. Science fiction, so I, too many writers had read, too many fantasy writers read Tolkien and thought, I can do that. And too many had read uh, Orwell and thought, yeah, if it was going to be really horrible, we're all dressed in grey dungarees that fall apart and eat, you know, Brussels sprouts for the rest of our lives. And I thought, no, no chums, it might be fun, you know. Um, so, I mean, as, a, as an example, you know, that maybe it would be cool in the future, that's about it, though. I don't know how, you know, what well, the practical purpose it might have. In, in, in terms of the sort of, I mean, you have a relationship with crime as a genre, although it'd be difficult to say you were a crime novelist in, in perhaps the conventional sense, but... It seems that that's a form which has been peculiarly open to dealing with certain social questions and peculiarly hampered by the fact that usually at the end you've got to have a solution, even though reality is rather more resistant to solutions. Can you talk a bit about how you... Yeah. Well, what are the opportunities and what are the challenges there? Yeah, I, I think it's actually um, now increasingly old-fashioned to think that um, crime must tie up... Um, you know everything, and I, I, I read an interview with James Kelman recently. And it, it, when I was a as a young writer, I wanted to be James Kelman. That was who I really wanted to be. Um, I didn't have to be James Kelman. He was Position doing a very good a very good <laughs> job of doing it. But but he was talking about the way that crime is is frivolous because of this tying up everything. And I thought, gosh, you've not read a crime book for ages because that is no longer necessary. Um, I think this idea of uh, the flaneur, really, somebody who goes through the city, somebody who is um, on some kind of quest, is uh, very associated with crime, very useful for crime. And part of the reason that crime fiction can date so quickly is that it's often intimately connected with social problems of the time. Um, I suppose the thing that interested me in when I first in my, my first book, the, which I think is possibly the, the most crimey. Um, the cutting room, um, I guess, is this idea that crime fiction or noir fiction often picks on others um, to, to be the, the, the bad guy. Well, you, when you find the, the guy that is drinking with his pinky out from the, the china tea teacup or the, um, the man with the limp <laughs> or the person that speaks with a foreign accent, often you have found your criminal. And I suppose part of what I wanted to do was to turn that around I was writing that book in uh, 2000, and I think it was written with a lot of humour, but also with a lot of anger. Um, I think you'll remember it was the, the time of the campaign against the clause that uh, Sir, Sir, now Sir Brian Sutter had um, initiated. And for me, it was a very hurtful thing, actually extremely hurtful, extremely upsetting. Um, and that was part of the motivation <laughs> for my character, Rilke, being gay. And the, the clause is never mentioned in there. And I think, um, I think that perhaps is a, a lot of the politics within novels. We don't need to state it yeah. out loud. It's not a manifesto, yeah. and yet it is, um, it is there. It's intimately there. And I think that works in sci-fi as well. I think science fiction is a, a fantastic medium for politics because you're looking at society. And it's a reflection of now. Yeah, the other thing about crime, crime fiction, and, and, and it's, it's it's these genres are becoming kind of, kind of yeah, you know, yeah. these labels are not very so good, but but, uh, but, but, but you know, as soon as you're dealing with crime, a crime, whatever it is, and particularly if you're dealing with murder, but not just, you then have the whole, usually have the whole apparatus of the law and the police and the you know ju the judicial process and all of that stuff, which is by its very nature, intensely political. So, you know, uh, in a in weird kind of way, I think actually crime, ri writing about crime is, a, is, a, is the best way of getting at politics because through, through literature, because all of life and, and death is there 
um, as a result of, the, of those, th those factors being in it. And somehow that's reflected in uh, previous works of yours like Joseph Knight, where the crime of slavery is addressed by 18th century yeah. Scotland, yeah. in The Fanatic, where particular crimes about deviance are dealt with within the sort of theocratic tradition. Um, there's always been a kind of strong religious element there. Just briefly, and there'll be one more question from me after this, um, how do you see the relationship between religion and identity playing out in Scotland, in Scotland's literature? In Scotland's literature? Like that. <laughs> <laughs> and probably, hopefully in society as well. I mean, I do, I, you know, I mean, yes, there's been a lot of religion in my, well, the first three books. The first three there was, books. There wasn't much in the last one. Deliberately kept all the ministers out of that one. <laughs> but, um, but no, I mean, I'm, and I know I've been fascinated by religion and Scottish religion and our capacity for doing horrible things in the name of religion and, and doing sometimes quite good things in the name of religion as well. So let's not, you know, tar everybody with the same brush. Um, but I do think we are, I think we are increasingly in a, a, a post-Christian age in our society and I think that's reflected in a lot of the ongoing developments and I, and I don't think that's a bad thing but, I, but you know the, but the, 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 the downside of that is, um, is th I think that sometimes the, um, the, 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 the messages that came through religion were, were, were not all bad and sometimes they had quite in, important moral things to say to us. Now I think we can actually develop a, mor a, a, a morality that doesn't rely upon um, God or whoever it is that might or might not be up there. That beam's going to come loose in a minute, probably. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, but, but on the, on the other hand, even a post-Christian morality will be informed by some of the things that have gone before. So, you know, there is a continuity there, and I think it's important to actually understand that, and that's why history is important and so on. Um, but in terms of, you know, religion having a particularly strong presence or influence in our literature, I suspect it probably isn't going to have much in the future. But who knows? You know, we, we, who knows where we might be in 10 or 20 years' time? Right, that, that sex quite neatly into the last question. I'll ask it. It's for, for all three of you. Um, all three of you are now published in London, although James and Louise have both been published by Scottish publishers in the past. Were Scotland to become independent, do you think there's any problems, advantages that you would have London publishing would still have the kind of hegemonic position that it has within English language publishing. Could you see yourself returning to Scotland? Mm, here's a thought, yeah. Um, very good question. Isn't that a shame that all, a good question doesn't always come with a good reply from at least one <laughs> of the people here? Uh, yeah, I mean, what my publisher is, I mean, now, my science fiction editor, and I've got two, as it were, and my science fiction editor is based in Manhattan, you know, um, and it's not Manhattan Airshot or anything, you know, it's, you know, the, um, uh, so it's already become internationalised. I mean, it's, it's, it's Little Brown, uh, but they're part of the Hachette group, which is you know, this gigantic conglomerate. So uh, they're basically part of a European and you know, sort of multinational thing. But, uh, and I would love, in a sense, yes, to be, to be published by a Scottish publisher. That'd be great, you know. But um, uh, I know that in the end, my agent will be very hard-headed about this and, and she'll be absolutely wanting as much money as possible, you know. Um, so I don't, yeah, in, in principle, yes. Mm. My people would have to talk to her people or something. <laughs> um, I don't know, but I'm, I'm published by John Murray now, who of course are part of the, the, the same group, but we're a, a venerable um, Edinburgh publisher. Um, I, think, I think you would be published wherever you had good editors, wherever you had people that were willing to invest in your work and believe your work and enable your work and wherever you felt that there weren't any limitations put on your work. I feel very privileged to have been published in Scotland and certainly wouldn't have any profile at all without that publishing experience. I guess what, what I would like to see is um, investment in publishing. I would like to see publishers and, let's face it, other firms. I mean, if, we, if we're going to be a, a, a different nation, can we make some different rules? Can we say things like um, no internships? Scrub mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. They're elitist mm -hmm. and they're exclusive. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they sure don't. Done, done yeah. Can, a lot yeah. Can, yeah. Can, can we do that kind yeah. of thing? Um, I don't know. If they, if they, if they gave me, uh, I never know how to say his name, Chine Melville. 
um, which, uh, Italian, yes. but when he was talking at the the parliament, uh, not the parliament, at the Edinburgh Book Festival earlier, he said, "Oh well, you know, writers are always complaining about money. Um, let's just give them a good artisan's wage." I, I just think yes, a, yeah. a maximum wage, yeah. not a minimum wage. I could live wage. on that. I don't need a lot of money. That would be fine. Give me a good artisan's wage. Give me a flat at the top of the building, like they used to do in the old Soviet times, because I need the exercise to get up and down the <laughs> stairs. Um, I would be happy with that. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't need a lot of cash. I would like to see bookshops being subsidised. I would like a, a, a culture within our, our nation um, that involved bookshops, that involved publishers. Um, I guess we just have to see what happens next. I suppose to sort of turn the question on a bit, James, that there's the, a, a difference between the fact that every writer is situated in their own specific time and place, but you're not writing for only people that are within that time and space. And, you know, with you, one of the things which was um, a real accolade was that the Richard and Judy book group took on a book which many people thought was kind of as if Scottish interest meant Scottish interest only. <laughs> Mm -hmm. but it actually had a more global reach and I think that is something which has improved in the last generation that there isn't a feeling that at Hadrian's Wall you stop reading Irvin Welsh or James Robertson or Ian Banks or Louise Welsh. Well yeah that's true up to a point but I also have to say that in my last book Amber Landry Still which is obviously a very Scottish political novel um, it, it is, has done pretty well here and uh, it's done much less well in the rest of the the UK, and it hasn't sold at all anyone else in the world. Um, and it's the reason that I'm given for that is because it's perceived to be too Scottish. But having said that, there is, I, mean, I am published by, um, from a children's books, I'm published by a course, Scottish, course. and in fact, that's <coughs> the same Scottish publisher that's always, that started off publishing my original book of short stories, and they are, they're going to publish a book of stories, short stories for adults in the autumn. So I've kind of still got a foot in the Scottish publishing camp, but yes, I'm published by Penguin now, and previously by Fourth Estate, which was a London publisher as well. Um, but the reason for that is because my first novel was rejected by all the Scottish publishers I sent it to. So, you know, <laughs> to some extent, you, you, you go with... You go for it. You yeah. go where somebody's saying, yeah, we, we, we believe in your work and we're going to publish it. And I, you know, I, t I think Ian's point is very true. You know, we're in, we're in a, 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 a period of amazing flux in terms of the, the world of publishing and books and so on. And so it is kind of international as well. Certainly if Scotland were independent, I don't think that immediately London would shut up shop to Scottish authors. Yeah. Um, I don't think that would, I don't think actually anything much cha would change there at all. Um, um, but it might mean that you suddenly had a bit more dynamism in the Scottish publishing industry just by dint of greater world exposure. So you might get a bit more direct kind of contact between the world of Scottish publishing and the rest of the world rather without having to go through the channel of London, which could be yeah. interesting. And so one last little thing. Uh, the number of people I've talked to in publishing who are you know, basically all, well, ones that I'm talking to are almost all in London, and they come up here, especially to Edinburgh, but Scotland in general, they go, oh, I'd love to live here, but I can't. You know, my job's in London, everything's mm -hmm. concentrated in London, and it wouldn't be, you know, a Herculean effort, you know, if you did your cheese of independence, for this place to pass laws, I mean, it, you know, not, not terribly, you know, not, not nothing to um, corrupt or anything, but just made it nicer, easier for publishers to be here, you know, sort of, um, that would be quite a good thing. Uh, and they'd be like a shot, a lot of them. Quite and I think, I think it's also worth remembering that, that 100 years ago, Edinburgh was a massive publishing centre. In fact, you know, John Murray and, and half of the people who are now based in London, I don't know, Hamish Hamilton, who's my hardback publisher, I don't know, he sounds like he must have been a Scotsman, I have no idea. <laughs> but, you know, all of these, so many of these publishers started in, in, in Edinburgh or in Glasgow and, and migrated south. So there's no reason why that couldn't be reversed. And, as you, and I think Ian's point is a very good one. Too, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I guess the other thing is that we should also remember there are a lot of um, small publishers that are operating very, very well here. Lewis, Black and White, Sandstone... And, um, and others who, who may get bigger, who may not want to get bigger. Um, so, so there is a, a, a vibrant scene, even if it's not as, uh, it got as much money at, at the moment. And, and Sandstone Publishing, which you mentioned, is an absolutely fantastic publisher. They're producing amazing stuff and they're based in Dingwall, I think. Um, so they're not even in Edinburgh and they're doing an amazing job. So yeah. I believe this new um, worldwide intercommunication web is actually quite useful for <laughs> taking jobs out from London, particularly in the kind of jobs where you're reliant on the written word. Really have to open it up to the audience. Um, who'd like to ask the first question? Can we go to the lady at the back there? 
I can see Ms. Winston's uh, mic, and then we'll come to you afterwards. Can you use my mic? Apparently not. Um, Do I use that? They don't have the MSP chip that makes them work. Hi. Oh. I was just wondering, Scottish politics is completely obsessed with the referendum in 2014 and is likely to be so for the next two years. To what extent is that influencing your work, the work that you're working on right now? Yeah. Well, in my case, to my, my shame, I realised when I was talking to Stuart in the green room earlier, uh, and we were talking about that, and, and you mentioned that my last, noticed that my last novel, Stonemouth, hadn't mentioned the debate at all. And I, Oh, yeah. So in my case, no, <laughs> not very much. Um, I think it depends to what extent you feel you can say anything that's particularly useful. You know, um, I've been always been fairly upfront. You know, I used to vote nothing but Labour until it became New Labour. Then I've, I kind of got a bit you know, promiscuous and voted for whoever I thought vaguely sort of left wing that might have the best chance. A protest vote sometimes, or a decent chance of getting into power. Uh, I've now become a Scottish nationalist voter because uh, they're quite far to the left compared to most, most everybody else, really. You know. Um, and I would certainly vote for a, you know, as, as much, uh, as much devolution or, as, or full independence to go for, for the maximum. Um, so I've been sort of upfront about that, but it's kind of, it's almost like that's my sort of, you know, my public life, as it were. Whereas, you know, it's almost as though the writing is the private stuff in which I'm just dealing with all the other issues. Um, and I think there's always that danger when you're a writer of any, you've got any sort of forum uh, or ability to address people directly, is that you're, you're sort of seen as posturing and. You know, hectoring people and telling them what to do and so on. I think it's difficult to, to get that right. And you'd almost have to deliberately... I, I feel no need to be balanced, you know, when I'm sort of saying, yes, I want independent Scotland. Don't want the bloody Queen as head of state. I don't want a public, do you know, um, you know, Other uh, forms of government are, are available, I understand. Um, whereas in the, if I was writing about it, I would have to put the opposite point of view. I'd have to get the old yeah. BBC-style balance in there, you know. So I don't know. The yeah. point of having to have the opposition. Uh -huh, yeah. the point of so I think, to have the opposition, as I was saying, it's in there, it's an idea-driven process. If, you had, if I had ideas that kind of implied that you know, I did have to write quite you know, deliberately directly about the referendum debate, then you know, I'd, I'd certainly tackle it. You know. But uh, I don't know if I will or not. If I don't, then... You know, but almost anything that's going to be set in Scotland in the next two years, it'd be like almost perverse not to mention it, I guess, if, if it is definitely a contemporary novel. So I guess you'd have to. It's interesting, isn't it? Because I, I feel that I write with two different parts of my brain. I write with the front, very conscious part that's, that's working lots of things out. And then I think there's the, the, the other side um, that's doing all the sort of Freudian stuff. And sometimes it's when I look back on work that I've done previously that I realise in a way what I was writing about. So, so I may be writing about the referendum without, without knowing it. <laughs> um, at, at the moment, I'm writing a series of um, three novels set in London. Oh, there's, there, oh, no, not set in London. They begin in London. Um, and the, the central character is the first character that I've written that we won't actually know her national identity. Um, uh, uh, as it stands at the moment, but I realise um, the novels will finish in Orkney, and I don't know if this is some unconscious metaphor <laughs> or what. You know, who knows? Who knows? You, you, you mustn't analyse your own work too much. Um, I have started, though, uh, for fun, for myself, just for fun, I have started a little file on my computer called Glasgow Machismo, um, which includes things like the, the taxi driver that said to me, will you look at that boy crossing at the lights? And I'm like, what, what's wrong with them? Like, the lights are not for the likes of him. They're for women, <laughs> women, old folks and cripples. So, you know, so that's, I'm going to keep a wee file of tho those things. Um, but I don't think that's anything to do with nationalism or the, the referendum. <laughs> yeah, but I, think, I mean, I, 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 certainly I'm not intending to write something that's specifically about the referendum. But I, I think sometimes those things come into focus after they're over. Uh, for, 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 for writers of fiction. Um, and certainly when I was writing Anne the Land Lay Still, I mean, I was writing years after the events. I always knew I wanted to write a novel about the, 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 the battle for, for the Parliament. Um, but it wasn't until s seven years after the Parliament got here that I started writing that book. I think a bit of time needs to elapse. And of course, it depends on the outcome of the referendum. I might decide I don't want to write another thing at all about <laughs> Scottish politics, depending <laughs> on the result. But what I have been starting to do, I've been writing quite a lot of poems. Um, I've been asked by two or three people to write things, you know, what are your views about 
the future of Scottish politics, the referendum and all the rest of it, um, just in kind of wee short essays, um, um, and, and the, one or two of these are due to come out fairly soon, I think. But I've also found myself writing poetry, which is um, quite polemical, and it's almost like I can throw those out now, and it's not like I'm necessarily saying this is the answer or this is, you know, this is how you should all vote, because I don't think it's my business to tell people how to vote, but it, it certainly means that I can, I can push things out that say, have you thought about this? And, you know, this might be relevant in the next couple of years, you know, um, uh, but in a sort of non-sort non of dictatorial way. So that's about, that probably answers the question from my point. Somebody just in front had your hand up and then we'll come to you, sir. Um. Seems to work, but there's another one coming as well. Yeah. Hi. Um, I was just wanting to pick up on something that Louise said there and about um, you know, being ha having a voice and, and being able to, to write a story. I mean, I think at the moment we've got, you know, in our schools, our future writers are there at this moment, but we do have a very prescriptive way of teaching people how to write because it's about passing exams. And... I just wonder if, you know, with a change through maybe, you know, being um, independent, that we could get to a stage where, you know, sometimes through change, creativity is much more apparent. People are, feel much more confident about trying new things. And I guess my question is in sort of two parts about how writers like yourselves, um, how publishers, you know, because that is very market-led as well about who does and who doesn't get published. But, you know, do the panel think, what, what could we do within our school systems? And I'm talking from primary stage, nursery stage even, um, how that could be done and how the digital world can help us with that. Because we, we do live with our e-book right, readers, et cetera, et cetera. So how can that? So more voices are heard. I think just to, just to say, to, you know, when answering this, we might set the digital one slightly to one side, it tends to be an issue which rather metastasizes and takes over everything. But I think the educational point is a very important one. And Louise, do you want to? Yeah, I think the, the, I think the educational point is, is huge. And to, to enable children, whether they have talent or not as well, because of course, not everybody wants to be a writer. Being a writer in many ways is a, a rather silly thing to do when there's a great world out there and we only sit, sit at our desks. But I think to... I guess for me, to, to somehow convey that everybody's voice is valid and everybody's voice um, has a right to be heard. And I think it's, it's something that is difficult to, to legislate for, isn't it? Um, but to give people a, a sense of, um, of self-worth. And I think that there's, you cannot underestimate the power of seeing yourself on screen or somebody like you on screen or, or in literature. I still remember the first time um, that I read The Wasp Factory and just how amazed, how empowered I felt by the anger in that book, you know, the anger at Thatcherism um, that, 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 as I took it to be, um, the power of something like train spotting, even though it's not your life, it's, you can hear voices that you hear on the street. Um, and I think sometimes it just takes one or two people to, to, to make books like that. I've just read a, a fantastic book by a young Aberdonian writer, Kerry, Kelly Hudson, which, um, if you've not read it, is called, oh, Tony Hogan. Tony Hogan bought me an ice cream before he took Be away before my mom. He, before he stole my ma. It's a fantastic book, and I feel that's one of those books that will be opening up um, the creativity of lots of young men and, and women now. So I think, yeah, somehow conveying that sense of worth, letting people read and getting writers into schools, um, but not writers like me because there's too much sex and violence in my work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I would agree with that. And I, I love the idea of actually um, enabling people to be creative readers as well, um, partly because people like us need readers. But, 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 I mean, not everybody, as Louis said, nobody, not everybody wants to be a, a writer or should necessarily be a writer. But I do think, you know, if you, from, from primary, from at primary level, it's absolutely crucial to try and get uh, young children thinking about, about language as a creative tool 
in, in as many different ways as possible. And, and one of the objects of the, of the Scots language books that, that I've been producing with, with other folk over the last 10 years has been precisely to do that, to try and get, um, give them extra tools and also to validate some of the words and the, and the, and the, uh, that they bring to school and the, and the, and the, and the way that they use them. Um, because that has been, until very recently, had been largely excluded from the classroom. Um, but the other thing I would like to do uh, is I would like to completely revolutionise the school system um, by doing away with the kind of the rigorous exam sort of hurdles that everybody has to get through, which, yes, suits some of us. I think I was good at sitting exams, but that was because I was, had that kind of brain and I, and I had that sort of ability to sit through two hours writing essays until your hand dropped off and so on. But loads and loads of kids, that's not right for them at all. And it's, it's a, it's, it, it actually stunts their creativity rather than actually encourages and expands it. And I, my, my fear is that Scottish education, you know, we live on this reputation that Scottish education is so bloody wonderful. Um, and, and it obviously has been very good in many respects in the past, but it isn't as great as it's cracked up to be. And it still, I think, doesn't actually deliver to the widest possible number of, of, of people. Um, and, and I would love to see some really revolutionary thinking going on about how we break out of that idea that you must get these exams in order to, you know, that, that if you don't get these exams at this particular juncture in your life, the rest of your life is going to be limited or curtailed or, or, or destroyed. And I, and I, and I, I, I fear that in, in, in an independent Scotland, it, we might actually corral the wagons tighter around the education system rather than actually liberating it. Um, but um, you know, it'd be interesting to see where education was going with that. Um, yeah, I get the impression there are certain politicians, or at least the people you listen to perhaps, who if they could make essay writing um, uh, a multiple choice question somehow, they would do it. Um, yeah, I basically agree. Yeah, I think, um, and I, I so have some personal experience in which quite a lot of my best friends are teachers. Uh, and to a man and woman, they're all deeply disillusioned now. And they're about my age, they're kind of approaching retirement age anyway. Um, but they went in with tremendous enthusiasm. And they're now leaving, you know, kind of, not exactly broken people, but they're just pissed off with the whole thing. And they still love the actual teaching. It's all the bureaucracy associated with it. Uh, and also, you know, what, what, what you're touching on, just the, 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 the box-ticking mentality. And this has kind of been forced us again, you know, by by marketology, by this worship of the market that, you know, has basically taken over our society, that the market is the only way forward. If you have to listen to the market and if you have to listen to the captains of industry, because they will tell you the kind of people you want to produce, bollocks, basically. I think that's absolute nonsense. And you're absolutely not going to produce rounded individuals. Uh, in a sense, you know, you can't get much, much more rounded than a writer. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, I know. I didn't think I'd get away with that one, frankly. But, but yeah, I think so. Yeah, so I would um, say we need a, a, a different approach to education. And, and a lot of it just comes down to ask their bloody teachers. And they say, if you want to know how to, what, how to work the health service, ask the doctors, ask, ask the nurses, ask the, the people who are helping out, everybody else. Um, that's who you should be talking to, not these the corporate clients and the spin doctors and the Absolutely. bloody lobbyists. Um, I think if you use the one on the... Yeah. Yeah. And then we'll come to... This the point, it ties partly with the last question, but also with your discussion about Scottish publishers. I'm thinking today there's a, a fairly a revolution now in the availability of online publishing where literature is available not, you know, not only the range, but also internationally. And so on here. I'm just wondering. I mean, is it is this likely to affect how writers write their, write, knowing that now we're writing for the this wider international thing world rather than just writing for a, a, a limited. You know, and, and that obviously affects what, what things are published as well. When the publishers know this is maybe available now in a much wider context than previously. It's a, it's a very good question, and I knew I couldn't keep the digital one down. So are, are, are we going to get Fifty Shades of Dree? <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. I don't know who wants to go first. Um, hmm. I, think, I think the wider the audience, the better, really. And I think um, as a reader, and I think I'm first and foremost a reader, I think all, all writers are, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in finding out about different people's lives. I'm interested in finding out about um, how Inuits, live and how people live in America and Germany and so forth 
So I don't think it will um, stop, a wider audience will stop people writing about their locale or about specific places, because I think we're, we're endlessly interested in that. And I think the other thing, the other secret um, <laughs> that, uh, is that we can only write what we can write. And, and I personally would like to write a very serious sort of Eastern European style book. And every time I sit down to write it, a joke creeps in, and that's me back to the same, you know, the same nonsense. So, um, so I, thi I think writers really can only write what they themselves can write. I think, I think one of the, 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 the issues that is sort of implicit in your question, though, is that, that as publishers learn about this, this world of e-publishing, and it is a very new world for, for, you know, and so we're all sort of moving into it a wee bit uncertainly, and there are pros and there are cons and there are pluses and minuses. But, you know, one could see, for example, that, that if um, the vast bulk of e-publishing is going to be channeled through one or two sources, you know, through that, the Kindle or whatever it is, that that could actually change the nature of what publishers want from writers in the sense of saying, well, look, um, uh, you know, the way that we sell a book these days is not through high street bookshops because there aren't any left, so we must sell it through the internet and therefore we must give people a, um, a, a portion of your novel to read for nothing in the hope that they then buy the rest of it. Now, that could then put pressure on the writer to really produce a bit of hardcore sex at the beginning of the book or, or whatever it was, or a, you know, or a cliffhanger or something. And, and that could change the nature of, of, of writing to some extent. But what I'd also like to think is that there are enough of us out here who actually would go on doing what Louise has just said, which is we would write what we write because that's what we do. And that therefore, somehow, the, the, even if the market went in that direction, there'd be enough of us out there who would produce something that was different. That, that would that would you know negate that, but that's a sort of a kind of creeping worry that could happen. But that's about it seems to me about who controls the the, the market, um, and 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 if you can if we can ensure that there's a sufficient diversity in the market for 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 different modes to get out there, hopefully that would be not too much of a danger. I don't know. Um, yeah, my only uh, sort of issue is. Uh, I was not want to sound too selfish or mercenary about it, as long as it writing remains a viable career for some of us, you know. I think that's, because um, it's nice to have the freedom to write and be able to, to devote your, you know, your, your whole life to it and rather than have to, have to have a day job, you know. Um, I think they, in some ways, the most interesting, well, one of the most interesting aspects might be length, size of story. We kind of have, you know, the, the, a rough idea. I mean, people have stretched it, you know, been, Ian McEwan himself has produced some stuff that's not really novel length, frankly. You know, it's not a novella or novelette, whatever. Um, but they actually, they might, they might by this sort of freeing um, the, the story from the, the paper book, to some degree at least, they might find that people start to write stories at exactly the right length, rather than sort of pad it out to novel size, as it were. Uh, and you might, I'm not sure, exactly sure how you sort of charge for that, you know, through, through the, the outer web, but uh, you might find that the, 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 the you the stories become exactly the right length rather than having to be, you know, what the publisher thinks is the correct length for that, that kind of uh, well, genre in particular. I speak as one, you know, working in two genres, mainstream uh, and science fiction, and the science fiction books are always longer. Uh, that's just me being, you know, verbose, but also it seems to be an expectation. You can get away with, um, you know, science fiction books being a lot longer uh, than, uh, say, uh, well, something like The Wasp, actually, 65,000 words. Uh, my science fiction books are regularly about three times that size, and somehow that feels about right. But you might find out via electronic publishing what exactly the right story, right length for every story is. Maybe. Uh, actually, I'm, as I'm saying that, it sounds pathetically idealist. So. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Just, just to add one tiny word of caution of my own, the extent to which devices like the Kindle gather information about your reading habits, which then can be shared with publishers and providers of content, is actually quite a a strange and I think um, concerning idea. So yeah. a writer could be told, we have discovered that 70% of your readers stop reading on page 250 out of 300. Therefore, in your next book, you are going to have to write it in such a way yes. it will conform with this uh, aggregate out there. Now, it doesn't matter if one person thought it was the greatest work of genius that ever touched them and read all 300 pages. The extent to which that information is gathered and sent back to uh, accumulators of that kind of data, I think is the thing that publishing has to really 
pulled out again. So I think we've got time for one more question. There's a young person here. Oh. Um, except, except from Silly and Two a Mouse, when I was... Oh. Uh, except from Silly and Two a Mouse when I was in primary six, I can't think of a single time during my time in education where we looked at Scottish poets or Scottish writers. Um, and do you feel that that stymied the development of the Scottish literary canon in the 20th century and beyond? It's a great question to end on, and certainly it's a great panel to discuss it with. Uh, James, I think how, how, how good it might have been, how many of them might have been. I think we're punching way above a weight as it is, so if it had been even better, you know, if it had been sort of better served via the education service, uh, blind me. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question because there's been quite a debate lately about whether for example, uh, about reintroducing, well, there is now going to be a, a, a compulsory question on Scottish text in, uh, which exam is it? Advanced higher? Mm -hmm. Well, it's uh, called English. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but I can never remember what level it, that this is going to be at. But, yeah, it's but, changed so much. But, but you know, that, that, I suppose in a way that relates back to, the, to what I said before. I mean, yes, I think, you know, um, we should, we should be en enabling our children to read the literature of their own country and it should be, we, they should be getting uh, access to that. And it is still, I think, quite shameful that, uh, that children can go right through school and, and people can go right through school and university and still not actually have any, you know, and studying literature and still not actually have any real sense of the literature of Scotland. But there's a, there's a slight danger there because you don't want to do that to the exclusion of, of, of other literatures. Um, so, um, um, whether that affects, the, the, uh, whether that has stymied the, the development of Scottish literature in recent times, no, I don't think it has, because I think we've, there's, there's been so much new Scottish writing happening. Whether that Scottish writing has been reaching um, school-age readers or not is another thing. Um, I don't know, it's an ongoing discussion. I'm not quite sure where I sit on that. I mean, obviously, I, I, I favour Scottish literature reaching as many people as possible. Um, um, but, but I think it goes back to the question, the three, I'd like to see education so revolutionised that actually this stuff was just there for, for people who really, really wanted it. They would just get access to it um, through all kinds of different means. And, and, the, and the, 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 the internet, the use of, of, of the internet and, uh, and, and resources through um, the likes of Education Scotland, I think, may well actually end up providing those gateways for people to explore the, 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 the literature of this country. I was just trying Please. to remember if I'd studied any um, Scottish literature at all at school, and I remember we did look at Sunset Song, which I, I loved, you know, Scotland's favourite favorite book. Um, I don't know. I, I think I agree very much with James on this. I, I, I want um, people to be reading international literature and Scottish literature. And I was just trying to think, if what, what would I prefer? Would I prefer people to be studying my books in school? Well, that'd be quite nice, wouldn't it? You'd have a guaranteed... Um, it's, amount of sales which is always quite good or would I prefer for them to be passing it around under the desk like <laughs> like <laughs> contraband um, so it, yeah I, 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 I want I guess people to come to Scottish literature around the world you know people in, in, in other countries to read us as well I, I guess I'm more concerned that we don't get Scottish history perhaps as well I didn't study any Scottish lit history at school I would like if there were more than one department of Scottish literature in Scottish universities. I, I understand there's only uh, one, which is at the University of Glasgow. Um, so, so yes, I would like it to be more widely studied, but I'd also like to be the dirty book getting passed around. I think, I think, there's, I think there's only one professorial chair in Scottish literature okay. um, or, and distinct department that way. But, you know, when I was at university in a place down south, I asked, could I do a paper on Scottish literature when the choice was everything from ancient Greek to contemporary French. And the paper that I was offered, the only Scottish paper that Oxford then offered was called Scottish Literature from its origins to 1603. <laughs> 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 I'm afraid we are just about out of time. Um, I'm sure some of you know the Archimedes quote where he says that if you give me a firm place to stand and a lever long enough, I will move the world. One thing I'm absolutely sure about with all these authors is that they can move the world, and that's because they have a very firm standing here within Scotland at the moment. Uh, I'm sure you're going to want to join me in thanking James Robertson, Ian Banks, and Louise Welsh.